Hi everyone! This video is an introduction to meiosis. It's going to provide some background information about what meiosis is and why it's necessary, and then in class we'll go into more detail about the specific steps involved in the process. The video is going to introduce a lot of new vocabulary, so make sure you write down all the words in bold and their definitions because we're going to be using them a lot in class. Let's start with a quick review of cell division. We've already learned about a couple types of cell division. Do you remember what they were? The first one was binary fission, which was used by prokaryotes for asexual reproduction, and in that process one parent cell gave rise to two identical daughter cells. The next process we looked at was mitosis, and you learned about all these different phases here. And mitosis is used by eukaryotes for asexual reproduction, growth, and tissue repair. And just like in binary fission, one parent cell gave rise to two identical daughter cells. The third type of cell division that we only mentioned very briefly before was meiosis. And as you may remember, this is the cell division process that is used by eukaryotes for sexual reproduction. We haven't really talked about sexual reproduction in class yet, so let's take a closer look at how it works. The benefit of sexual reproduction is that it shuffles genetic information within a population. So rather than being identical to their parents, offspring have a combination of their parents' DNA. How does it work? The first step is for parents to create gametes, which are eggs or sperm. And this process of creating gametes occurs in gonads, which are the organs designed for making gametes. In females, this would be ovaries, and in males, this would be testes. So a mother would make an egg, a father would make a sperm. There are the gametes. And the next step is for these gametes to combine via the process of fertilization. And when this happens, they create a special type of cell known as a zygote, which is a fertilized egg. And then that zygote will grow and develop into a new individual via the process of mitosis that you've already learned about. So what role does meiosis play in this process? Well, you already know that humans typically have 46 chromosomes. So your biological mother probably had 46 chromosomes and your biological father probably had 46 chromosomes. Now, if they just used a regular cell division that we had already learned about to create their gametes, and those gametes were identical to the original parent cells, they would have 46 chromosomes and then the zygote would have 92 chromosomes. And then using the process of mitosis, you'd end up with an individual that has 92 chromosomes. But you know that all humans, whether a child, a parent, or a grandparent, they generally have 46 chromosomes. So if that's the case, then each zygote must also have 46 chromosomes. So how many chromosomes must have been in each gamete? Well, using simple math, we can work out there's probably an even split of 23 chromosomes in each gamete. And so this is what meiosis does. This is what's special about it. It reduces the number of chromosomes by half during gamete production. So in humans, this means going from 46 chromosomes in the parent to 23 chromosomes in the gamete. And for this reason, we call meiosis a reductive division. It reduces the number of chromosomes. Well, why is this important? It keeps the number of chromosomes constant in a species from one generation to the next. So your parents probably each had 46 chromosomes. You probably have 46 chromosomes. And if you have children, they will all probably each have 46 chromosomes. But if you think about this mother making her egg via meiosis and going from 46 chromosomes to 23 chromosomes, could it be any 23 of her chromosomes? Could any 23 chromosomes go into each human gamete? And the answer is no, but in order to understand this, we need to learn a little bit more about chromosomes. So as you already know, humans typically have 46 total chromosomes per cell. And in that 46, 44 of them are what's known as autosomes. So chromosomes number one through 22 would be autosomes. And these code for pretty much everything in your body, all the proteins you make, all the processes that are going on, all of your body parts. But then you can see there are these other two chromosomes over here that are a little bit different, and these are the sex chromosomes, the X and the Y chromosomes. And the combination of sex chromosomes determines an individual's biological sex. So for this individual here that has an X and a Y, that would be a biological male. If instead they had two X chromosomes like this, then they would be biologically female. Now you can see from this diagram that the chromosomes come in pairs, and the pairs look pretty similar to each other. They're the same size, same general shape. So there are 23 different chromosomes that humans can have. You can see them all here. And we have two copies of each one. Well, why do you have two copies? The reason is that you get 
one of each from your mother and one of each from your father. So if we look at these two copies of chromosome one right here, one would be from your biological mother, one would be from your biological father. Same thing for this pair of chromosome two and the pair of chromosome three. Now these pairs, it's the same chromosome, but you got one from each parent, have a special name. They are called homologous pairs or homologs. So each one of these would be a homologous pair and each of the pairs going through one would also be a homologous pair. But each one of these 23 chromosomes contains very specific information. Each chromosome contains specific genes at specific locations or loci. The singular of this word is locus. So if we were to take a look at chromosome 20, perhaps the gene for eye color is located right at that location, right at that locus on chromosome 20. And if we were looking at chromosome 18, maybe the gene for hair color is located right at that position on chromosome 18. And these are not actually where these genes are located. I'm just making up a couple for the sake of simplicity in this video. But if this were the location of eye color on chromosome 20, that would be a location of the eye color gene for every human. The loci of all the genes are consistent for all members of the species. So it makes sense then that homologous pairs or homologous chromosomes would have the same genes at the same loci. So if we take a look at this homologous chromosome pair, chromosome 20 from mom and 20 from dad, and you can see we've got them in their replicated form. You can tell because they have sister chromatids. If the gene for eye color is right here on chromosome 20 from mom, it's also going to be on the sister chromatid because it's an exact identical copy. And that gene for eye color is going to be in the exact same position on chromosome 20 from dad and on its sister, chromosome, uh, sister chromatid as well but they are not necessarily the same alleles. They are not necessarily the same version of the gene. So you know that people have different eye colors. So there are different alleles for the eye color gene. Perhaps the allele that mom has is for green eyes and the one that dad has is for brown eyes. And you could have both of these alleles because humans have two copies of every gene and they can be different alleles. But you get one from each parent and the way that this happens is that parents pass on one of each chromosome. So to demonstrate why that's important, we'll run through a couple of examples. For this first one, I'm going to ask you to put down your pen or pencil and just watch for a moment. So here we have a mother whose cells each have six chromosomes and a father of the same species cells each have six chromosomes as well. And you can see they're in homologous pairs, two large, two medium and two small. Now you already know that meiosis reduces the chromosome number by half, so you know that the gametes will contain three chromosomes. So what if the mother in meiosis passed onto the egg three chromosomes that includes two large and one small, and maybe the father will pass on one large and two small. Now when those combine via fertilization to form a zygote, we get a cell that has the correct total number of chromosomes. You can see it has six, but it has three large ones and three small ones, and it doesn't have any of the medium ones. So any genes that are on that medium-sized chromosome would just be completely missing in the offspring. And it also has too many copies of some of the other genes, and that can be bad too. So this is not going to work. So let's see what actually happens. And you can start taking notes again here if you want to. When the mother undergoes meiosis to produce eggs, she's going to pass on one of each chromosome. So one large, one medium, and one small. And the father will do something similar when he makes sperm. And so when the egg and the sperm combine, we're going to end up with a zygote that has two of each chromosome, just like the parents. And so that's the goal of this whole process. So this is how it actually does work. And we have special vocabulary to describe how many copies of each chromosome an organism has. It's a weird word, it sounds kind of strange. It is ploidy. And ploidy, the definition is just how many copies of each chromosome an organism has. And it depends on the cell type. So I'm gonna tell you about a couple different kinds of cells that you're going to need to know. Somatic cells are regular body cells. And in humans and most other animals, those somatic cells are diploid. Now you probably know what that prefix di means. It's two. So diploid means two of each chromosome. So an adult female human would be diploid, an adult male human would be diploid, and for humans that's, that means they're going to have 46 chromosomes each. But because parents pass on only one of each chromosome, gametes are haploid. And that literally means one of each chromosome. So when parents make 
their gametes here in this meiosis process, they're going to be passing on one of each chromosome. So in humans, that's going to be 23 chromosomes in the egg, 23 chromosomes in the sperm. And then when the gametes combine in fertilization, they will create a diploid zygote, which will go back to having 46 chromosomes like the parents did. So when meiosis reduces the number of chromosomes by half, it also reduces the ploidy of cells from diploid to haploid. Let's take a look at an example of an organism with a different number of chromosomes just for practice. So hippos, like humans, are diploid, but rather than having 46 chromosomes, they actually have 36 chromosomes. So when hippos produce their gametes using the process of meiosis, those are going to be haploid. How many chromosomes are going to be in each gamete? Yep, 18, because they're reducing by half. So they're going to have one of each of 18 chromosomes. And when those gametes combine via fertilization, they're going to produce a diploid zygote that has, yeah, 36 chromosomes. And then that will develop via mitosis into a diploid individual. It still has 36 chromosomes, just like its parents. So even though the number of chromosomes is different, you can see that meiosis still reduces the number of chromosomes by half and produces haploid gametes from diploid individuals in this other species. Now there's one other thing you need to know about meiosis before class, and it has to do with the number of divisions that are involved. So you already know that cells always replicate or duplicate their DNA before cell division. So this is what happens during that S phase of the cell cycle. So here's another example of a cell. This one happens to have four chromosomes, so two copies of each of two chromosomes. So after the cell replicates or duplicates its DNA, it's going to have sister chromatids, and you'll see we have four replicated chromosomes like this. In the starting point here, it's got two of each chromosome, so it's diploid. Now over here, it's actually still diploid because even though it's replicated, this is still considered one chromosome and one chromosome. So it's still considered a diploid cell. So how does meiosis reduce the ploidy or the number of chromosomes? And the way that it works is that the first step of mitosis actually separates the homologous pairs. And so we end up with two cells that each have two replicated chromosomes. But all sister chromatids need to be separated by the end of cell division because there's still double the amount of DNA. There's still too many copies of each gene in there. And so it still needs to go through another round of division in order to separate the sister chromatids. So this requires two rounds of division to get through this process. And you can see that we started with four chromosomes and each of the resulting cells has two chromosomes. So we've reduced the chromosome number. How about the ploidy? Starting cell had two of each chromosome. By the end, cells have one of each chromosome. So we've also reduced the ploidy from diploid to haploid. And the process creates four cells, unlike mitosis, and these cells are not identical to the original cell. So that's a lot of new information. Let's wrap up with a quick review of some of that new vocabulary. And we'll focus on cell types and ploidy. Do you remember the two different cell types we looked at in this video? We saw somatic cells and gametes. So somatic cells, as hopefully you remember, are those normal body cells that are created by mitosis and their ploidy is diploid. So in humans, that means 46 total chromosomes because you've got 23 from mom and 23 from dad. Gametes, on the other hand, are the eggs and sperm that are created by meiosis in the gonads and they are haploid. They have one of each chromosome. So in humans, that's a total of 23 chromosomes. We're going to spend the next few days in class using all this new information and vocabulary to learn about meiosis in more detail. So until next time, you know what to do. See you in class.